website. Well, shall I just get going? Yeah. Well, I think we ought to. Good evening. Welcome uh, to this Frontline Club debate. Uh, I'm Mark Urban. I'll be chairing it. Um, I'm very glad to see you all here. Um, foolish person that I am, when I was approaching the club, I saw all these vehicles with uh, satellite dishes on. I thought, no, oh, uh, I see there's quite a bit of international press interest in our <laughs> debate tonight. Uh, of course, it's the royal baby, I'm told, that has caused all these uh, satellite vehicles. Has it happened? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, we, you'll be the first to know. If, uh, we'll bring the news hot from the presses. So that was the reason why they were all here. Of course, we all know that there are certain agencies that will be getting live streaming of this through our iPhones and other devices, should they wish to do so. And therefore, there's no need for all those expensive sat trucks outside. Um, I've had an interest in this for, well, decades, I would say. I remember more than 20 years ago, I was interviewing Robert Gates um, just after he uh, left his position as director of uh, the CIA. And we were chatting away, and he was drinking from his mug of coffee, and he put his mug on the desk, and I'm talking, and I'm noticing that the mug has the symbol like the seal of the President of the United States, but it said National Security Agency uh, across the top of the seal of the United States. Then I noticed that the eagle had a pair of headphones on. <laughs> then I noticed that underneath the legend, which is, of course, on every dollar bill and whatever under the seal, it says, in God we trust, it said, all others we monitor. <laughs> uh, so they, they have a certain humor about it themselves, I would think it's fair to say. Uh, the theme tonight is uh, privacy versus security. Have we got it right? We've got a brilliant panel. Uh, each of them will have a chance to, if you like, make an initial statement or give their views initially. Um, then, depending on how we're doing time-wise, uh, I might ask one or two questions. But if, if uh, time is galloping away with us, I'll go straight to you guys, uh, and, and hopefully we will ensure that you get plenty of chance uh, to ask your own questions, uh, should you wish to do so. Um, John Norton is going to be the first person uh, to give a brief statement. Uh, John is a technology journalist. He is a research fellow at the Center for Research into Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. Uh, also emeritus uh, professor at the Open University, um, and essentially somebody with a hell of a grasp of technology and how it impacts on our lives. So John, could you go first, please? Thank you very much. Um, good evening, folks. I, too, thought the satellite dishes were for us. Um, alas, not. Um, the, I, I have some reservations about the way this um, discussion was originally framed, because there is certainly a trade-off between privacy and, and security. But, but my concern is that I think there's a trade-off between democracy in the sense of a, a popular sense of an open of an open society, and the levels of surveillance that we are now subjected to. Um, my real question is: Can we sustain the reality, if not the myth, of having uh, real democracies uh, in situations where our political masters feel it's essential that our every move should be uh, essentially surveilled. And I don't buy the I don't buy the argument, and nor do I think should you, um, that uh, that where you have these what Alan Bennett would call and smooth man from the government um, saying, well, don't worry, dear boys, we're we're just collecting your metadata. Um, th that's either an unbelievably ignorant and stupid thing to say or it's an unbelievably cynical thing to say. Um, because, as many of you know, the metadata is what you need. That's all you need most of the time. And that's what they're collecting. So th let's get away from that. Now, now the, the other thing that, that struck me about it was um, the, the, the constant assurances we've had since the Snowden story broke, uh, again, by, by smooth folks from governments on either side of the, of the, of, of the Atlantic saying, well, um, you mustn't worry about this, folks, because it's all done under legal oversight. Uh, so there's, there's really no need to worry, um, because it, it's all legal. And then you say, oh, yeah. Um, and the thing that struck me after a while was I got fed up with people saying, uh, using the adjective Orwellian in this context. Um, and it seemed to me that, of course, <laughs> dear old Orwell would have been awestruck by the kind of stuff that's possible now. Um, but actually, a much more appropriate um, adjective, I think, is, is Kafkaesque. And when I was trying to think about this from my newspaper column in The Observer, I, I suddenly thought, well, 
what's it really like? What's the essence of it? And I thought of this, this set of dialogue, which is basically between the state and the citizen. And here it goes. The state says, smooth man, smooth spokesman says, now, although intrusive, uh, intrusive surveillance does infringe a few liberties, uh, it's necessary if you are to be protected from, from terrible things. And the citizen says anxiously, oh, what terrible things? And the state says, I, I can't tell you, I'm afraid, Joe boy. <laughs> but believe us, they are truly terrible. Uh, and, and by the way, surveillance has already prevented some terrible things. And the citizen says, such as? And the state says, oh, sorry, you can't go into details about that, you know. So the citizen says, so how do I know this surveillance racket isn't just bureaucratic empire building? And the state says, oh, you don't need to worry about that, dear boy, because it's all done under legal authority. <coughs> and so the citizen says, well, oh, good, how does that work? And the state says, uh, regrettably, we can't go into details, <laughs> because if we did so, then the bad guys might get some ideas. So what it comes down to, folks, is trust us. Okay. And the trouble with that is that in recent decades at least, our political elites, our political masters have done precious little to, preserve, to deserve our trust. And now we're being asked to suspend our disbelief as they eavesdrop on all of our online activities. We've been asked to trust them in a way with the most intimate details of our private lives. And all on the basis of laws that they, or their <coughs> security apparatuses, wrote in order to rationalize and legitimize their snooping. Now, trust is something that can't be demanded. It's something that has to be earned. And it just so happens, it just so happens that virtually every public and corporate institution in our society has, in recent times, demonstrated how untrustworthy it is. This applies, of course, to our dear banks and their regulators. But it also applies to politicians who fiddle their expenses, take the country to war on dubious premises. It applies to the British tabloid media and to the politicians who were so cravenly enthralled to them. It applies in spades to the police and even to regulatory bodies like the Care Equality Commission and so on and so on and so on. Now, if I'm going to put my trust in anybody or anything, I've got two criteria. The first is that the recipient of trust must have integrity. The second is that they must be competent to discharge the responsibilities that are entrusted to them. Now, with regard to integrity, see above, uh, as they say. With regard to competence, well, let's just consider the British government's legendary skill at managing complex IT <coughs> projects in the civilian sector. <laughs> that is to say, in the open, OK? The only charitable thing one might say about Whitehall's capacity in this regard is that most of the time, it couldn't run a bath. <laughs> Yet we are asked to take it on trust that the government's ability to manage immeasurably more complex IT projects in the secret domain is beyond reproach. How do we know, for example, that the unconscionable amounts of money that have been unloaded onto GCSQ uh, at a time of, of austerity are justified? Is GCHQ a competent organization? Is it fit for purpose? Has it been engaged in bureaucratic warfare and mission creep? What evidence is there? What objective evidence is there? that broad scale as opposed to targeted cyber surveillance has generated the results that are paying for it, and so on. At the moment, we have no answers to any of these questions, although mercifully, we have Sir Martin Richmond this evening who may indeed be able to provide them. Sure. But is, sorry. Up to then, then, we only have William Hague, and that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to call now on Professor Helen Margetts, who's director of the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, focusing critically on digital governance and politics. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the question of the debate was, is there a trade-off between privacy and security? Um, and is it right? Yeah, have we got the right trade-off, essentially? Have we got the right trade-off? Um, and I think the answer to that is no, but perhaps for a slightly different reason um, to John's, which is that we, we're, we're focusing on the one thing. It's not a straightforward relationship. It's not a kind of linear relationship. It doesn't... If you've, if you've got... If you've got... Uh, if you want security, you've got to have, um, you, you've probably got to have some kind of loss of privacy. But if you have loss of privacy, you don't necessarily get more security. And I think that's where we're at. The, the massive assumption in the whole debate over recent events has been that, you know, we, anyway, we've got, we've got more security. We may not like it, we may not think it's justifiable, but we've got more security. 
And I think if we want to get good value for our kind of loss of privacy, we have, there's three things that ought to be scrutinized that perhaps haven't been scrutinized um, as much as other things. Um, one of those things is, is, is motive. Um, the, the, the sort of original motive of the, um, of, of the Tempora program was supposed to be mastering the internet. Um, and I think um, when you talk about mastering the internet, um, it would be uh, quite, quite wise to remember um, a quote by the, uh, uh, about, uh, by the German philosopher um, Heidegger, who said, um, "So long as we, uh, so long as we, um, uh, 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 as long as we represent um, technology as an instrument, we remain we remain held fast in the will to master it." And I think that might be is what's happening to GCHQ. But uh, when you look at any of the quotes in any of the very useful articles that many people hear. Um, have written. Um, everything about the motive um, is related um, to size. Mastery um, seems to be um, about size. We are, we are starting to master the internet. Our current capability is impressive. Biggest internet access in five eyes. Hitting a new high of more than 39 billion events in a 24 period. An exciting opportunity to get direct access to enormous amounts of data, huge amounts of data, deep dive capability. A kind of information race between NSA and GCHQ. Um, Cheltenham now produces larger amounts of metadata collection than the NSA, the NSA nervously said. It's like a massive race to collect huge amounts of data um, with uh, not so much of a huge idea um, of, of, about what to do about it. So I think motive is one thing that needs to be um, scrutinized. Um, John mentioned the question of cost, so I won't go into that, but it's, it, 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 it's an important point that's very rarely raised. We have no idea um, what Tempora costs. Um, Prism is supposed to have cost uh, $20 million, um, which is completely and utterly ludicrous, um, as one tech blog put it. Um, no security um, consultants won't get out of bed for less than $100 million. Um, the actual cost is probably billions. Um, so so the, the, the cost of these programs, uh, not only the financial cost, but also the opportunity costs. What else could have been done um, with that kind of um, expenditure of, of, of money and effort? And the third thing is, uh, the third thing that we should sort of scrutinize, I think, um, or, or, or uh, there is an urgent need to find out more about, is what's actually being done with this data. We hear far more about all the bad things that aren't being done. We, everybody um, is reassuring us what isn't being done with the data. But what actually is being done? First of all, you, you know, what, what has actually been achieved? And we hear a few things about that in, in terms of security. But what about all the good things that, that might be done that aren't being done? This is a special kind of data. It's, it's, it's so-called big data. It's real-time transactional data about society. It reflects the kind of societal weather, if you like. It's the, it's the social science equivalent of, of scientific data about atoms or rain. It's transformed social science research, or it's going to. It's, it's transforming journalism. Um, but it could also be used to, by government to improve itself, a kind of self-improvement, if you like. There's all sorts of unrest, um, um, uh, uh, complaints, protests, needs, behaviors, preferences that could be analyzed for the purposes of self-improvement in terms of government services, the legitimacy of public policy. Um, the, obviously, there would have to be massive ethical constraints um, uh, and controls and the legal controls on, on, on doing that kind of thing. But I think that as soon as the, the public or, or any of us hear that government is undertaking a large-scale technology project to collect huge amounts of data, it, we, we can't uh, sort of conceive of that being used to do something good. And that says two things. I mean, one, it reveals something about government-citizen relationships. It shows that um, governments are unwilling to see the same trade-off between privacy and security with government as they see happily when they go about that, or not always happily, but I mean, as they are willing to accept 
for going about their lives on social media, for, um, for example, getting advertising targeted at their own private email conversations in exchange for free use of that email. They see the trade-off there. They, if, if people are buying cat food, they accept the fact that um, superstores are, are doing stuff with their data on their buying beha behavior. They may not totally like it. They may hope it's controlled in ways that it perhaps isn't. But they kind of accept um, the trade-off to get cheaper and possibly better cat food. <coughs> They don't seem so willing to do that with government, and that, so that reveals something about government. And I think the way that the, these three things that I've mentioned are not being scrutinized with respect to this particular trade-off mean that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the discovery, the revelations of the, of the last months are, uh, are further exacerbating that loss of trust. It is very interesting, uh, you and John have both touched on this point about trust between citizen and government. But then you've also at the end there alluded to, to corporate behavior. Uh, and uh, to what extent is that wide open in a sense uh, as a relationship to be reinterpreted or renegotiated in the light of these revelations? So I'd like to ask John Kampfner next, so obviously a brilliant columnist and journalist, writer of books uh, on Blair's wars, etc. But uh, also a consultant to Google uh, on, on the, some of these matters, uh, personal uh, security issues or privacy issues, uh, to, to have a quick go as well on this, on this topic about the balance between privacy and security. Sure. Thanks, thanks Mark. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll uh, address uh, any questions or, or uh, people have about uh, Google and other tech companies and PRISM um, uh, when, when questions come. I just wanted in the, the short time we've got for our little sort of introductory remarks uh, to make three points or three clusters uh, of points, because there's so much to say in this, it's, it's hard to know where to begin. But I'm sure any, question, uh, any questions or thoughts will be covered um, at a later point. The first, I can't resist, an unashamed uh, piece of um, self-promotion. Um, Freedom for Sale, uh, my last book published in 2009, <laughs> asked just this very question. In fact, I posed at uh, the heart of the book the following rhetorical question. Why is, it why is it that increasing numbers of people around the world, irrespective of geography, history, or cultural background, seem increasingly willing to trade their freedom in return for the prospect of either prosperity or security? That was in 2009. That was before any of this um, came up. The difference between then and now is a lot of the prosperity has, um, has, has disappeared, <laughs> but um, the security question, well, only for the Western parts of, uh, of, the, of the world. Um, uh, but uh, the question is as uh, live as it ever was. In fact, I would argue um, more so than ever. And what I did briefly was I took four countries that are broadly uh, regarded as 21st century authoritarians, which is very different from the 20th century dictatorship model. Um, Russia, China, the UAE, and importantly, Singapore, which I'll come to, and four democratic, uh, uh, quasi-democratic countries, UK, US, India, and Italy. And what I found was that without making moral equivalents um, and uh, leaving aside all kinds of, of different characteristics, this trend of the voluntary ceding of personal liberty in return for other goodies is absolutely hurtling apace. And I call it the Singapore model. Um, I was born and brought up in Singapore, where um, large numbers of, of Singaporean friends who've all got fantastic degrees, Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, LSE, you name it, um, quite uh, strongly, intellectually, can defend this trade-off. And I found it endlessly fascinating to debate with them uh, why um, it is not just a fact, but it is laudable um, so to do. So for me, it is anathema, but it is, it is absolutely essential to understand where this pull is coming from. And this pull is, um, is global, um, and it's one that ultimately, I think the politicians... Um, and this is po a, a controversial view, the politicians are actually responding to societies. They're not actually um, uh, perniciously leading 
um, societies. Um, and if you talk to politicians, when they look at focus groups and opinion polls on all manner of issues um, around uh, criminal justice, um, surveillance, and everything else, um, and the figures are not where I would like them um, to be. And in Britain, um, I, I think my British chapter is the darkest of all of them. Uh, I won't go through uh, the litany of uh, pieces of legislation and actions that have taken place um, all the way through, um, but they really reached a peak um, under various Labour Home Secretaries. But um, Theresa May, with her Snoopers Charter, um, is doing a very good job um, of uh, extending um, um, all of that. And you look at the original Ripper um, Act, which uh, is extraordinary in its scope. It's one thing to give your security services, your anti-terrorism forces, um, the potential right to snoop on you. But local authorities, the ambulance service, um, uh, hundreds of public bodies have got the right and have had the right now for 10 years um, to survey people for dog fouling, for um, uh, wrongful um, uh, use of litter, um, you name it, it is extremely easy for local authorities and other um, uh, public bodies um, to snoop. So that's my, my first set of points. Um, the second one is uh, the two phrases um, I find most uh, dangerous and frightening. If you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to hide. Um, and um, we must do whatever it takes. Um, and the second one always crops up um, after a terrorist outrage or a similar action. It is on one level politically completely understandable that um, uh, any minister or similar would say that. Because if you look at it from their perspective, to let through one uh, individual or to take your eye off the ball in one situation um, uh, is a worse political and potentially societal gamble than to do whatever it takes theoretically. Um, and I see to John's point about um, the fact that nobody has ever told um, how things happen um, means that the trust factor is uh, uh, extremely low. Um, but it's quite obvious um, why you would do whatever it took, because politically, um, the uh, other side um, is impossible. But to do whatever it takes, to seek to guarantee total security, just the words guarantee, is absurd. No country can do it. Not even North Korea can do it. Um, so uh, the political language, which again, I would say, comes down in a large part due to the yearnings of society is one that cannot allow for balance. Balance does, from the beginning, doesn't exist. It's not a question of the scales being a little bit wrong or whatever. It's the debate has not been had and is not being had. And my final point, and I wrote a, a column about this uh, in, in the Evening Standard last week, and I said, um, I mean, my whole area of the last five or six years is freedom of expression. It's fighting censorship um, around the world and um, at, at various points. Um, closer to home as well. And what is deeply <coughs> dispiriting, I was in Tunis about a week after, for an internet conference, about a week after the prism, the, the first batch of prism revelations came out, was to hear how so many um, Middle East activists had lost, had a single uh, piece of journalism, um, had pretty much destroyed the confidence of activists in the uh, bona fides of governments who profess to be supporting their freedom of expression um, around the world. In Britain, the Foreign Office, um, and in the US, particularly under Hillary Clinton, the State Department, had a fantastic, and I think genuine, and well-intentioned uh, set of policies to promote um, free expression. And we're really pushing things, and promoting and supporting bloggers, doing all kinds of good work. But somebody just um, said at this conference um, to me two, two quick quotes. One Jordanian who simply turned around um, to an American and just said, I now realize that everything I've written, everything I've done, you just handed over to King Abdullah. Um, you know, test the proposition. It's impossible to uh, uh, prove or, or to disprove and always will be. And the second one said to me, look, everything you're trying to do on censorship is now null and void. The big question is surveillance. Thanks very much, John. Um, lastly, I'm going to call on uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Many of you obviously may know him. Uh, he's very much 
uh, got a privileged uh, position of access to this uh, story, both as a former foreign and defence secretary who would have signed some of the submissions <coughs> that uh, the intelligence services might have put forward uh, in your capacity as foreign secretary, but now also obviously as the chairman of the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee, uh, who have swung into action to investigate uh, the Snowden disclosures and their implications. Sir Malcolm. Thanks very much indeed. I, I was interested by your opening comment, Mark, about uh, when you visited Langley, the CIA headquarters, the coffee mug, and what you read on it. I also went to Langley a few years ago and uh, uh, saw Leon Panetta when he ran the CIA, and I got a commemoration CIA mug. What I did, which you perhaps didn't do, is I looked underneath it and it said, Made in China. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's quite true, and I said, I hope that means Taiwan, and I was told we don't know. <laughs> so there, there we are. Uh, I'm, I'm going to concentrate my remarks on the role of the United Kingdom's intelligence agencies in regard to this wider debate. But can I just say one of the things I agreed with what John just said is that the powers under REPA, for example, for local authorities to intrude on people's privacy, in my view, is totally unjustified. It's hardly ever used by most local authorities, but it shouldn't be there in the first place. And uh, there's examples of that. I, mean, I just simply account. say it was a bit like a justification somebody in government once said to me about CCTV, um, who said, oh, don't worry, most of them don't work. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm, but I went on to say, but they should be removed anyway. I'm not justifying the part. I think it's absurd that it was ever put there in the first place. Okay. But let's just go back a moment and look at the role of the intelligence agencies up to the end of the Cold War. The role of intelligence agencies was overwhelmingly, for the first 60, <coughs> 70 years of their existence, espionage, state secrets. It was finding out what the Russians were doing or other governments were doing. It didn't actually involve, except in very rare occasions, the private citizen. Two things have happened since 1991, the end of the Cold War. The first is that the major threat and the major task given to the intelligence agencies is no longer espionage. That's still there on the margins. It's counterterrorism. That's the first big change. And the second big change, of course, and linked to that. Well, and, and sorry, what counterterrorism means is that you are trying, their duty is to try to prevent terrorist incidents in the United Kingdom against British citizens. And you don't know that an ordinary member of the public is a terrorist until you find evidence that points in that direction. Terrorists look like anybody else until the evidence is obtained or the terrorist incident itself happens. So that inevitably, if you're going to do your job effectively, has to have some implications for privacy. But the second big change over that same period in time is the massive growth, not just of technology as a whole, but of the internet, uh, of uh, emailing, uh, of the whole way in which we now communicate with each other. And it's not just the good guys who communicate, it's the bad guys who communicate as well. That is how plots are developed. That's how 9-11 happened. It's how 7-7 bombings in London happened by various people, some in this country, some in Pakistan, some in other countries, communicating with each other, either with a mobile phone or on their laptops or social messaging in various ways. And they're mostly pretty smart guys who either encrypt their messages or try to conceal the true content of what they're trying to get across. Now, it is interesting, over that same period of time, you have also had a huge increase, not just in the risk to privacy, but in the protection against the abuse of privacy. Because up till 25, 30 years ago, there wasn't even a statute in existence governing the work of the intelligence agencies. They simply answered to ministers. There was no act of parliament until the 1990s governing MI5, MI6 and GCHQ, not until, 1990, until the uh, <coughs> Intelligence Services Act of 1995. Since then, we have had the creation of the committee I chair, which is not part of government. We are members of parliament of both houses, bipartisan. None of us are ministers. All ambitions spent, none of us expect or wish to be ministers again. Uh, and our job is two things. First of all, to criticize the agencies if they abuse their powers, and secondly, to make clear they haven't abused them if we find that is indeed what the evidence points to. But in addition to the committee that I chair, and I can comment more on that if anybody wishes me to, we have also, for the first time since the 1990s, what are called the Interception and Intelligence Commissioners. They are judges, utterly independent of government. Retrospectively, they have the power to look at every single approval that was given to any of the agencies by ministers to intercept in various ways uh, and to retrospectively examine whether the procedure was properly carried out, whether there was any abuse, 
whether the power was used properly. But in addition to that, the agencies, when they operate, these powers that have been referred to, operate not under one act, they operate under three acts that control what they can legally do. One is the Intelligence Services Act, which says in turn, I'm talking about intrusion on private citizens' uh, privacy, they can only get the power to intercept communications, uh, either for data or for content, uh, if it's on either uh, national security grounds uh, or it's on uh, serious crime uh, prevention. That's the Intelligence Services Act. If they think these criteria are met, they then, under REPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Practices Act, uh, have to go through a pretty complicated procedure uh, which requires them to make submissions to the Secretary of State, either the Home Secretary or the Foreign Secretary. And I have seen, and my committee have seen, which not, most people don't see, the actual examples of the submissions themselves. They're not just ringing up saying, can you give us permission? It's not just a scribbled uh, request on one page. It is three or four pages of closely reasoned argument as to why, at that stage, the agencies feel they have evidence that the particular individual may either be a potential terrorist or being involved in serious crime, and that is why they are asking for authority. And if that permission is granted, it's granted for a specific period, and it is retrospectively examined by the commissioner. Now, one of the great, uh, the third, sorry, I said there were three acts. The third act is the Human Rights Act. And the Human Rights Act, which is equally binding on the intelligence agencies, requires them to be, have procedures in place on privacy matters which comply with human rights legislation, as has been laid down not just by our own courts, but by the European court uh, that governs these matters. Now, I can't, <laughs> this is, I can't go into all the detail for obvious reasons, but I can go into a lot more detail, I can go into a lot more detail than you, your, your comments suggested, quite openly, because they're not national secrets, about the procedures that are followed. And what I, what I, what I would simply say is, 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 is this, that the agencies, if they have, they do have power, huge potential access. Uh, you mentioned closed circuit television cameras, that's huge potential access. Nobody believes for a moment that there's somebody or thousands of people sitting watching what's on these cameras every day, seeing what everyone's doing. It's physically impossible, but no one has the remotest interest in doing that unless there is a crime that has been committed or is about to be committed uh, of a serious uh, kind. It was suggested that there's no value in the interception that takes place or very little value. Let me tell you, ask yourself, and I will give you the answer if, if you aren't aware of it, why in America since 9-11 there's not been a single further example of that kind of a mass atrocity, or why in this country, apart from the 7-7 bombings, not a single person has been killed since re Rigby a few weeks ago. In each and every year since 7-7, or since 9-11, whichever you prefer, there have been at least one and sometimes two terrorist plots in this country that have been uncovered. In many cases, you have read about it because they've ended up in court and have been sent to prison uh, if they've been convicted for long numbers of years. In many other cases, they were disrupted by the intelligence agencies at an early stage because they didn't want to risk leaving it, even though they were trying to get more and more evidence. But the important thing was to make sure incidents didn't happen that led to loss of lives. And I know for a fact that in each of these terrorist plots that were disrupted, it was metadata, communications data, that was not the only reason, but it was a substantial part of the evidence that was available to the intelligence agencies to discover that a plot was being carried out. And I can give more information on that later on if anybody wants me to as to how that is done. So don't underestimate the value of this stuff. Now, I use the example of, of closed circuit TV. Let's move it just for final comments, because I don't want to speak for too long, uh, in regard to the recent controversies about uh, vast amounts of information being, as it were, brought into these ag agencies. The implication is that GCHQ either is willing to or has the power by itself to look into the content of your emails, my emails, my telephone com uh, communications and so forth, that is not the way it works. And uh, my colleague will know far more about the procedure than I do in terms of the technology. 
But basically what happens is that we have, there's no human being that looks at all these massive numbers of emails. The, com the, the computers, modern computers, can filter very, very quickly vast amounts of material. And what they are tasked to do is to look for particular words or phrases that might imply a terrorist intent, shall we say, or a criminal, a serious criminal intent. For example, the name of a known terrorist, or the email of a known terrorist, or the telephone number of a known terrorist, or somebody who refers to explosives, or somebody who refers to various things. There's quite a large number of these selectors. And the computers automatically exclude 94, 95, 98% of everything, because these words don't exist in the vast majority of emails that everybody uses or communications that we have. So nobody's ever seen them. They've been totally excluded from any further consideration. And gradually, it's filtered down to a relatively tiny number, relatively in terms of the percentage of the total, very, very tiny in percentage terms, where some of these uh, selectors, these indicators, have been found to exist in these emails. Even then, before they can actually look at them, before a human being can look at them, in GCHQ or MI6 or MI5, they have to get permission from the Secretary of State, giving the submissions that are in each and every case that involves anyone in this country, not just British citizens, anyone living in the United Kingdom. They have to get that, <laughs> that written permission, which is itself subject to retrospective examination. So there's a huge amount more I could say, and I'm happy to say. I don't want to take up all the time available. But do not allow this to become a debate about sweeping assertions, about everyone's email, we're all being surveyed, every, all our emails are being looked at. It's, it, it just isn't true. It's not physically possible, even if anybody wanted to do it. It would be a serious crime if anybody tried to do it, and it doesn't happen. I am 100% convinced. Now, I'm not to say, uh, very final point. Obviously, I cannot exclude, nor can anybody else, that an individual in GCHQ or an individual in MI6 might abuse their powers. That <coughs> happens in any... Uh, human condition. But in terms of a systematic policy of that kind, uh, I just do not believe it's physically possible, uh, nor is it politically sensible. No one has a self-interest to do it any more than hundreds of thousands of state employees looking at the CCTV cameras every day just in case something might come up. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one quick question, and then I'm going to open it up. Um, we know, uh, in the American case, from the submissions to this secret court, the so-called FISA court, right. that an incredibly small number of these applications are refused. We know, in the UK context, that it's very rare for the commissioners who look at these things retrospectively yeah. to say this was not justified. You know, something really bad yeah. has happened here. Um, now, I I've spoken to people who put submissions through, um, and um, they will say, oh, well, we, we don't even try if we think the foreign secretary. There's all these um, aspects of a well-oiled civil service machine, of a well-oiled parliamentary machine, that don't want a high rejection rate. Wouldn't it be more credible if there was a higher rejection rate? Don't the interests of the way the civil service works as a bureaucracy actually, in that sense, thwart or undermine right. public trust because people see that there's only this incredibly small percentage of requests that are refused. Well, let me directly answer that. First of all, it's not civil servants in the general sense. We're talking about GCHQ, MI6, MI5. They're the people who put the submissions to ministers. It's not uh, civil servants within the Foreign Office or the, the Home Office. Let us start from the presumption, which not everybody may accept. Let's start from the presumption that the people who run the GCHQ, MI6, and MI5 are decent, responsible people with high levels of integrity. I think it's a reasonable assumption that people who run these agencies are people of that. They know what the law says. They know the conditions that have to be satisfied before the Secretary of State would be entitled to give them permission. So they are not going to put up any submission that they do not feel uh, is going to meet those criteria. Sometimes they'll get it wrong. But what is much more likely to happen, because we've, we've investigated this, and what, what I'm very happy to share, share with you is, is this. What very often does happen, and I don't know how often, I can't give you the exact figure, but we could find it out, uh, is that a submission may go to the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State may say, well, I'm not yet persuaded. 
you know, I can see why you've put this to me. There some, seems to be some substance in it. But what about X? Or you say you've got evidence that this person is a terrorist. It doesn't look very convincing to me. And it goes back to the agency. It's not a formal refusal at that stage. It is, goes back to the agency, and the agency either say, well, we actually have more information we can share with you, or the agency say, OK, we'll withdraw it. So it, it, you're right. It isn't marked as a refusal. It's never been refused. Mm. But it, nor has it been approved. Now, that can, these, these are... Is it not helpful to public uh, oh, trust to well, see that well, well, either sometimes we're sure. scaling back sure, when sure. the sense of threat sure. to national... The, the intelligence commissioners, who are judges, and the committee I chair, does get access to that kind of information. Of, we, we, we can ask for and we get examples of where the Secretary of State uh, may have said, uh, not just that he's refusing it, but may have said something more, uh, saying, look, I'm not yet persuaded, and until you do persuade me, the answer will be no. We, we get that information, but, you know, the public would still say, well, we don't believe you unless we can see the actual documents. Well, we have seen the documents, and the, judge, uh, the, the commissioners have seen them. If you don't believe what we say, well, that's, that can't be helped. But, you know, that, that's, that, that is, and we're independent of government. The commissioners are judges. Uh, we are parliamentarians, both Labour and Conservative, Liberal Democrat. Uh, so all party, bipartisan. And uh, th th that is a, a higher level of protection than exists in any other country except the United States. France does not even have a committee of the kind that I chair. There are no commissioners in France. Mm. And France is a democracy. And when Mr. Snowden, I, I don't go into the comments <coughs> of what he did or didn't do, for him to choose China and Russia, where <laughs> surveillance is used in order to deal with political dissent within those countries, not terrorism or serious crime, but political dissent, <coughs> uh, that seems to me at the very least uh, uh, slightly lacking in judgment, to put it mildly. OK. Uh, this gentleman in the front, sorry. I'll, we'll go next to you, sir. But the gentleman in the front row... William Binney, the uh, NSA whistleblower, said that the US, the NSA was giving the conditions that meant that the US was a, one step away from a turnkey totalitarian society. And Bruce Schneier, the security expert, said, uh, it's very bad civic hygiene to build technologies that could be someday used to facilitate a police state. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are legal protections to stop people misusing this, but if a <coughs> poorly conceived government or a, could, could easily change the law to make the data available to be abused okay. in a bad way, and that, that for me is the sure. big security concern about this. Okay. Can I comment? Uh, the, the technology is neutral, it's how you use the technology that determines whether it's acceptable or not. Now, even if the United Kingdom and the United States did not advance these projects, the country with the greatest growth in the technology is China. And m there are more cyber attacks from Chinese state authorities than from anyone else in the world, far more than from the Russians. So we don't particularly want to end up in a world where authoritarian systems like China, and to a lesser degree Russia, have the technology, use the technology, but the democracies somehow have taken a self-denying ordinance. That does not make sense. John, sorry, quickly. Uh, sorry. And then Helen. I just wanted to, um, Malcolm uh, referred to uh, Snowden's judgment about um, uh, China and Russia. Um, I think the tragedy of what has happened, and not just specifically the, the prism story, but one can go back to the London riots and David Cameron at a Cobra meeting raising the prospect of why don't we block um, direct messaging um, from phones? Um, and you look at all other, uh, various other issues around internet filtering. Um, there is no moral equivalence, um, as Malcolm rightly says, between authoritarian states um, and ours. However, we make their job incredibly easy. Mm -hmm. um, Putin, uh, the Chinese, they can quite um, understandably for their own uh, political audiences, accuse us of double standards, hypocrisy. And time and again, one hears the, uh, uh, the phrase, you're doing it, so why can't we? Um, and it may be disingenuous, but politically, um, it's incredibly powerful. And I was talking to one Asian diplomat after this prison thing. I said, so what do you reckon the Chinese uh, uh, view 
of the American capability is, as, as evinced by, by, the, uh, by the Snowden revelations. They said the Chinese wouldn't be remotely surprised. They worked from the assumption the Americans could do everything that they were doing. But boy, are they envious and are they trying to catch up. Um, and that's basically that. We are all in, we're all swimming in the same pond is now the message that people around the world have. And the idea, and it may always have been fanciful, that the US and the UK are somehow um, inhabiting on these areas a different moral plane is much harder to sustain. But <coughs> forgive me, it is a different moral plane because it is subject to external examination and validation uh, by uh, the commissioners, the by... The Duma has such... Has no, such it doesn't. Things. Nobody believes them. Well, but I mean, well, you know, but right, I'm but just simply saying notionally sure, they can make sure, these sure. arguments. Sure, the Russians claim they have the rule of law, but we know that I they know. don't. Uh, either you... Ex Either you believe that, broadly speaking, the United Kingdom does have a working system of the rule of law, and if you accept that as a premise, then that makes it, uh, there is no moral equivalence, yeah. because we have legal systems for ensuring that the agencies obey the law, and, and the I law mean, itself may need to be improved. I mean, I'm not separate debate. any moral equivalence, I'm just simply saying we're, we're really making it easy for yeah, them. Well, so to that's do. part of the public debate. To both of you also would like to just quickly come in, is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. Alan, first. I think it's the point is that you're creating for a future state something which we don't totally understand. The idea of technology being neutral is a very complex idea. I mean, I, I don't want to go back to Heidegger again, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's a very... It's not neutral. <laughs> it, 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 it's not neutral in the sense that we don't totally understand it, and it's very resistant to external scrutiny. I mean, large government IT projects that John were talking about are actually in some cases too complex to really really scrutinize. Data of this kind is too complex in some ways to scrutinize. Oh, well, it's not too complex, but you need a certain sort of skills and expertise to do that. And it's not necessarily mm -hmm. parliamentarians and, and yeah. judges that, that have those skills. Yeah. And what you do actually need, and what I was suggesting that you, I mean, if you want to do this kind of scrutiny, what you need is data scientists, some people are calling them algorithmists, but I can't pronounce that, who can actually, A, work out what to do with this data, because for this data to have value over and above the data that the security services have always had access to, uh, have long, long, long had access to, for it to do over and above, then this kind of data science is what you need to achieve these kind of results. That's inside the security agencies. And then outside, you need people who can scrutinize that. It's no easy, simple, or, or tried and tested task, but it, it's something we're going to learn how to do if we want to overcome that problem. John? Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to accept Malcolm's sort of assurances that, that, um, that he and his, his uh, colleagues and the commissioners are, are able to to uh, satisfy themselves on the question of whether or not these agencies are um, operating within the laws that we, uh, we prescribe for them. That's fine. Um, the, the problem is that, it's in my view, the, 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 the big problem is that um, <coughs> the technology uh, operates almost entirely outside of those laws now. Uh, what, what I mean by that is that um, if, if you, without a warrant, in this country, and I guess in most other countries, <coughs> without a warrant at the moment, um, GCSQ can scoop up um, all of our email metadata. Uh, under under REAP and other things, the state can scoop up all of our mobile phone uh, <coughs> metadata. Um, and without a warrant, uh, all of your click streams, all of our click streams, are collected. In other words, every website we've ever visited. Uh, and that all is done without a warrant. Now, now I don't have to tell you um, that, that if you have uh, access to your email uh, metadata, and if you have access to your phone metadata, which includes, in most cases, location information, and if you have uh, access to your click stream, then believe me, you have an amazingly detailed picture of everybody and what they do. If you doubt this, there, there are several tools. Go to the immersion... Uh, uh, site on, at MIT, and, and if you're a Gmail user, and bung in your Gmail address, and, and see the nice map you get of, of your of your Gmail. If if you're a Facebook user, uh, 
uh, you can do the same with the Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha tool and the rest of it. Now, we don't have access uh, to, to phone metadata, but, but a German uh, politician uh, sued for his under Freedom of Information Act. And, and the process they've built the most amazing kind of picture of the daily and intimate life of this, of this person. Now, the point I'm saying, that all I'm trying to say is that without any legal oversight, actually, uh, effectively, but Malcolm and his committee never, I don't think, get to this, um, we, we have built a surveillance system that's surveilling everybody all the time. And my question is, in the long run, can you, can you actually square this with liberal democracy, where everybody, but everybody in the society, is being surveilled comprehensively all the time? I remember talking to a security person years ago who was laughing at public... public um, uh, uh, alarm about about snooping and saying th these people think we're looking for needles in haystacks. What they don't know is that we have the whole bloody haystack. Mm. Um, and th that's the point I'm trying to make, really, which is which is this technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, and it's doing something to us, which in the end may have really profound impact on on our democracies. And that's the thing that worries me. It's not that 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 they're not obeying REPA or they're not operating within the Intelligence Service Act. There's something else going on over and above all of this, and it's bigger. Sorry, that's end rant. Next question. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm an old man, and I'm scared stiff, because I think I'm going to cock this up horribly. <laughs> I'm a scientist, and I used to be a journalist. I worked for Harold Evans as scientific consultant on thalidomide. I have a question for you, Sir Malcolm. What I want to know is why I am one of that small band of people who is under tight surveillance. This began in 2007. I want to know why, in a closed system, directories disappear from my computer. I want to know why, on the day in which I delivered a letter of protest <coughs> to the Foreign Secretary on the 13th of June, there was a break-in at my home and a floppy disk was wiped, and I want to know why spares for my um, printer um, have been stolen. This is a very, very serious matter. I have no means of redress. I'm not designing bombs, I'm not making bombs, but I do have knowledge that I know the government is desperately anxious to keep from the public. Just quickly, quickly, if you don't mind. We'll what I have discovered is that the world's favourite analgesic is causing one of the world's most feared diseases. And when Mr. Norton talks about damage to the um, to society at large, I can tell you, someone dies with dementia every four and a half seconds. Today, twenty thousand people right. will die. And in the next 20 years, there will be 200 million. And it's totally avoidable. Thank you. If we could, uh, we'll just push on for another qu question here. I just want to come to John's financial side of this whole uh, thing, because I read an article on 4th of July where um, Sir Malcolm uh, defended his decision of cancelling the televised uh, Postponing. discussion. Postponing the Telebus discussion of the ISC, in which I have found out that two billion pounds of taxpayers' money goes into our uh, surveillance uh, intelligence services. I would like to know if, if you ever decide to go televised, could you please ask how much of this money is actually spent on snooping on all of us? And how much of that money is well spent how much information do they get from snooping on us that justifies spending two billion pounds? Wouldn't it be better if they spend that money on people who are under the radar? Extremist organization people. And maybe, just maybe, if they had done their job properly and that snoop on the right people, maybe the horrible events that happened in Woolwich wouldn't have happened. Right. Uh, first of all, to the gentleman in front of me who asked the question, if any citizen believes that their, profit, their rights in any way have been infringed by any actions of the intelligence agencies, you have the right to uh, draw to the attention 
of the uh, tribunal. There is a special intelligence tribunal chaired by a judge who has nothing to do with the agencies, uh, who has the power to go into every uh, complaint that is made by a member of the public to find out whether there is a legitimate concern and if there is a legitimate concern to make sure that is dealt with. So if you believe the intelligence agencies have been involved improperly in doing anything in your house, that is the remedy available to you. If I may deal with the question raised by the other gentleman, uh, the agencies do not just deal with counter-terrorism. Obviously, in the last few years, that has been the main thing. But they not only deal with traditional espionage, they deal, for example, with trying to prevent a proliferation of nuclear weapons, getting information as to what might be happening in North Korea or Iran or other countries that might be developing uh, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, there's a whole range of other issues of that kind. Sure, I can't tell you the exact... Well, China, no, Russia, uh, and Iran, I, no, the, the, the of this country, and sure, sure. Well, first of all, no, first of all, a large part of their budget is spent on employing the staff that they have. And let me just give you one example why that is expensive. You take, for example, uh, the, uh, if someone, well, we sadly had a case of someone killed in the streets of Woolwich a few weeks ago. If you know that some individual is a terrorist, and you, if you have evidence that that person is likely to be plotting a terrorist incident, to keep that person under surveillance, you have to do it 24 hours a day, which means you have to have three teams of people, eight hours shifts, and it's not just one person carrying out it. There has to be a group of people uh, involved in that surveillance. So the, the manpower requirement to keep one known terrorist under surveillance is very, very substantial and therefore very, very expensive. Multiply that by the hundreds, if not several thousands of people who are known to have links with terrorist organizations living in this country. They're not all terrorists. Some of them are just economically supporting the terrorists, or they read terrorist literature, or they make very extreme speeches. But you can't ignore any of them, because any one of them might, uh, as we saw in Woolwich, uh, turn out to actually do what they sometimes are threatening to do. So that's where a lot of the money also goes. There is a sort of duality there, though, isn't there? On the one hand, you're saying how much is being spent is a vast amount of money, and on the other hand, you're saying why aren't you getting the right guys? Um, there's a sort of duality of attitude. And you too, John, in your earlier, when you opened, you, you sort of talked about the terrible record of government IT, as if, you know, as if, if GCHQ was wasting three quarters of the money on, it would in some way, you know, be an even worse problem no, no. than if uh, they were using it effectively to conduct ever more surveillance. No, 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 my, my, the, the, the thing that lay behind what I was trying to say is that um, we have, uh, the public has actually no idea whether GCSQ is much good or not. They may be terrific. I'm sure it's full of hardworking uh, civil servants. I do know because some of my colleagues in Cambridge are, are, are world experts in the security field. And they seem to me to be pretty sceptical sometimes about mm. the technical capabilities of, of GCSQ. And I also know that our smartest students won't go to GCSQ. They just won't. They go to Google, by the way. It's because <laughs> they get Facebook, paid a lot more. But, it's the, but, but, but the I'm point, I do, but the point is we don't know. Yeah, OK, right. let's, let's try and get through a few more questions, and then we can go on to another. Um, it's a question for Sir Malcolm. Um, when you described the warranting process, you said it was very targeted and went, it was directed towards named individuals, and that, that sounds all right and proper, but then when you described what happens pursuant to those warrants, you conjured up visions of these nightmarish compute, supercomputers sifting through everybody's emails, and that doesn't sound very targeted uh, at all. So my, my question is, <laughs> did you know that this rolling warrant process was going on, um, and can you explain why the fact that it was going on couldn't be told to the British public? Um, and if the part of the answer to that is that uh, terrorists couldn't find this out, could you explain why why that's the case? Because 
how could terrorists change their behavior um, in response to knowledge that um, everybody's internet use is being monitored? I, I can't see how they could get around it anyway. Right. Uh, I, your question implied that you're putting it the, the other way around to the way I yeah. was trying to suggest. What I said was, if the technology permits you to look at millions of emails, the computers are, are the only way you can do that, not by human beings. And the computers are given selectors which enable them to automatically filter out 95 or 96% of all the emails. So nobody's ever looked at these at all. It's only when you get down to a relatively small number that then, and even then, the agencies cannot just look at them. They then have to apply for the warrant to the Secretary of State. And, and the, 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 so it's, it's in that order that the system operates. Uh, let me make one other and very the brief... The first part of your question was, did you know... Yes, did you know about, about the rolling warranting process? Because well, I don't was, believe you mentioned uh, it in Prism any of the reports. A, a, forgive me, PRISM was a, an American process. Uh, no, I didn't know it, nor would I have expected to, any more than... Uh, I would any other country's processes. Does that not show, though, that the existing regulatory framework is no, no. not fit for purpose no, if you didn't know about no, it? No, no, for, forgive me. PRISM is, an, um, is a national security agency. We, are not, we don't have oversight of the American intelligence agencies, nor should we have. But the allegation is that Britain was deploying it or using yes. it. Yes. No, no, hold on. First of all, any British intelligence agency has intelligence it receives because there's cooperation between all the intelligence agencies that are, uh, have common interests. Uh, what the United Kingdom may receive from one bit of the American intelligence community uh, may be a fraction of what it receives altogether. The allegation that appeared in the press was that GCHQ had received, I think it was 197 reports through this PRISM process. That was the allegation in uh, the, the, the press. That is what we have been investigating. Right? We are not, we don't have oversight of American intelligence agencies. There's the Senate and the House of Representatives have their own intelligence committees. That's what they're doing at this very moment, and rightly so. Our job is whether GCHQ were doing anything that contravened the law. And the allegation was in the press, uh, or some parts of the press, was that GCHQ was deliberately asking the NSA to get intelligence on British citizens because that way it would get round the need to apply for a warrant. That was the allegation. Uh, whoever makes that allegation hasn't studied what the law, British law already says because British law says that the GCHQ has to ensure that it complies with the human rights legislation as well as REPA and what GCHQ uh, does is applies REPA warrant procedures either to, uh, to uh, interceptions it itself is carrying out or interceptions it has asked someone else to do on their behalf. They go through exactly the same procedure of applying for a warrant to the, to the Foreign Secretary uh, for that purpose or the Home Secretary for that purpose. Uh, and therefore, the allegation just isn't in accordance with the, the, the legal position in the United Kingdom. Now, I entirely absolve people who made the allegation from not realizing that. It's all pretty complex territory. But that's what, one of the things that we've been looking at to see whether there's a gap in the law that, even, assuming GCHQ wanted to, which is a separate matter, could they have done it without breaking the law? And the answer is no, they couldn't have done. They would still have been breaking the law if they used the NSA to get information from them. Forgive me, Mark. Um, um, yeah. uh, you, you said two statements just there that appeared to me to be at variance. On the one hand, you say you're investigating yes. the GCHQ links with yes. NSA and whether or not they've been in receipt of yes. 197 um, uh, files and case, case uh, note uh, bundles. On the other hand, you say it couldn't possibly have happened because it would have no. circumvented the law. It sounds as if you prejudged no, no. what your, uh, your investigation already, which doesn't help the transparency. No, on, on the contrary. No, no, there's two separate issues. There's, there's, first of all, could they have got this information without breaking the law? Because the law doesn't, there's a gap in the law. Right. That's the first allegation. 
the you answer is they could have done it. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. The answer is no, they couldn't have done it without breaking the law. Right. But what we are also looking at is, in any event, what actually happened? Were the were the proper legal procedures carried out in all these cases that are alleged, uh, or were they not? So we don't just ask GCHQ, please give us an assurance. If they give us an assurance, uh, we say, okay, what we now wish to see is the raw material that will confirm whether your assurance is correct or not. And since the Justice and Security Act, we now have, which we didn't have in the past, the power not just to request that raw material access, we have the power to demand it. Up till last year, uh, the, the, the intelligence agencies, if they got a request from the committee, uh, always agreed to it, but we never knew whether they were sharing everything we wanted to see with us. They can no longer do that, even if they wanted to. We now have the power to require them to provide all the raw material behind uh, the general issues that we are looking at. And that's a huge change in the, uh, in the powers of the committee. And uh, this is very important, so forgive me, I, I would like to make this point. What we are also now going to be doing for the very first time when we carry out an investigation, in the past, we have only been able to say to the agencies, please give us the information relevant to our inquiry. Uh, they don't send a forklift truck with all their files. In the past, they have done the editing function themselves. <coughs> in future, from now on, what will happen, we have, will have our own staff who will go to Vauxhall or Thames House or Cheltenham, look at all the files, and our staff, not the agencies, will decide which of the raw material we need to see or would wish to see. And that is a huge culture change for the intelligence agencies, because never before has anyone who's not been part of their own system been able to actually go into their building and look at all the material in order to decide what uh, the committee should see. Now, that was in the Justice and Security Act, which is now law. OK. Uh, yeah, I arrived a little late. But the, the one word that I don't think I've heard at all uh, today is the word consent. Because it seems to me that all of this, this, this uh, d very detailed program that you've been laying out for us, is done for us, for all of us, to protect us. And yet, uh, it seems that we haven't really, uh, as, a, as a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a, the broad public, been asked to, to give our consent to this thing. I mean, I know that there are the procedures that uh, parliaments pass the laws that, that you operate under and so on. But uh, it seems to me that it's only these very recent de uh, revelations that have actually led to uh, the beginnings of the proper sort of national debate of which this is part that hasn't happened up until now. And perhaps it should have done. And my question would be that. Isn't this debate um, basically happening after the horse has bolted? Shouldn't it have happened before? And um, yeah, that's it. That's Can it. I also just add, bolt something on the back of your question about consent, and I'd like to direct the question to John uh, and Helen, which is, to, to what extent do we as citizens, by being modern, networked individuals with a phone and a computer, give our consent, because that's the only way to make them work, to the companies who then turn out to be the partners, uh, so described in some of the slides, of the agencies. Is it possible to live a modern, networked life w without giving that consent? Do you want to start first or shall I? Um, I, I, I think it, uh, our lives are, our futures are bounded by the nightmares of two old Etonian writers. One of them is George Orwell, who thought we'd be destroyed by the things we fear, and one of them is Aldous Huxley, who thought we'd be destroyed by the things we love, <laughs> things that delight us. On the Orwellian front, as we know from the Snowden stuff and other things, we're doing pretty well. We're, we're well on the way to creating a nightmare. We're sleepwalking into a nightmare. Uh, on the other side, how many people here have iPhones? Right. So you love your iPhones? Yeah? OK. You have just walked into that nightmare on the other side. Uh, who, who here, who, is anybody here who doesn't use Google? Right, you've just walked into that night, nightmare too. The, the point is, you're exactly right. That's, this is the kind of strange existential dilemma of all this stuff which is we are sleepwalking into this amazing dystopian world. And we love it. Except we occasionally get, get excited <laughs> because we think that, that the NSA is snooping on us or whatever. But basically, you know, and it goes back to your point, John, about, about uh, the strange willingness of people to, train, to trade freedom from us anything, as long as it's kind of exciting. 
That is explicit consent, isn't it? When you tick the I agree box exactly. yeah. on your yeah. lovely new air book yeah. or... Uh, sorry. Well, well, yeah, it's the trade-off. because yeah. I, I think people are, are reasonably sophisticated in understanding that trade-off, in clicking the agree box, in going through the torture of booking a cheap Online flight. flight yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I think with the with the security issue and the things we've been talking about, I don't think I think that trade off is just much less clear. I don't think I don't think they that any of us can sort of give informed consent because we we don't know. It could be the best database ever, the best designed database ever, brilliant value for money, doing all so sorts of brilliant things with respect to cyber crime, um, which is after all another of GCHQ's missions as it were, it could be doing all those things. Um, GCHQ could be full of the best data scientists in the world, but we don't, <coughs> we don't know. I think that's the Why thing, therefore. The yes, this lady. I was going to ask for a show of hands of who had ever read the whole Apple uh, yeah. <laughs> agreement, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a saint, <laughs> this lady. I'm masked. <laughs> you don't look like one. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Carol Story, and I'm a photojournalist. And one of the things that haven't been addressed, and I can address it to the entire panel, we're really talking about a two-edged sword here. It's love-hate in terms of we are all victims, I think, that we are part of the social networking. I was accused just recently that I don't tweet twit and all the rest, and I say I don't have enough time in my life to do all the tweet twat and Twitters and all the rest. We are all are on Facebook for one reason or another. We have Twitter and we have a whole host of other things. We are already exposed. Forget about the security agencies on the global planet. We are there. We are in your face. We are actually partners in crime to whatever information is available to all of us because of the kinds of things we sign up for, whether it's signing the contract with uh, uh, Apple or doing Ryanair, God help any of us that have ever traveled on it, know exactly what we're signing off for. That information is public. And if anyone is working for any of those companies from a commercial perspective and has access to that information, although they say your information is blinded and it's kept secret, that information is actually can be sold, can be sold for a price. There's always someone that's going to be out there that is going to be vulnerable and be able to sell it from a commercial perspective. So for me, in, in a, a wide perspective for everyone on the panel. We do have a two-edged sword. We are partners in crime. Everyone's sitting in this room. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sitting here to listen to a very uh, uh, well uh, and knowledgeable uh, uh, panel. And so we are a part of this situation. The, the whole thing that has been precipitated certainly more recently about the, the runaways of who are uh, hiding in, in, in various parts of the world, we are part of that as well. Uh, and I'm curious against with the panel what your views are of all the companies that are participating, whether it's Google, whether it's Yahoo, and a whole host of all sorts of support internet companies that have our information. We're registered. Well, I think naturally that goes to John. I mean, we've heard from Sir Malcolm about the kind of uh, how seriously the state takes its obligations under certain statutes. Give us some insight into the private sector. I mean, we know that lo lots of companies look upon client data as a sort of balance sheet positive item, uh, something to be commercially exploited. Um, do you think they are taking seriously their, their duties of confidentiality, or are they just out to, uh, to make as much money from, from your browsing history or shopping history or whatever it is as possible? Well, I mean, first thing to say, uh, which is my sort of disclaimer, um, is that I don't speak for Google. I can give various pieces of insight and opinion now, um, but it's not, a, it's not an official position. I'm, I'm an independent um, advisor, and I tell them all kinds of things that, they, um, that, that are challenging. Um, and you can't say any more until we tick, no, I agree. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, on, I mean, on the, on the on, you know, John probably knows more about um, uh, how uh, users are actually sort of advertising fodder and, and, and customers and, you know, you don't get something for nothing in life and if you take a service for free, chances are, you know, a company that makes lots of money um, uh, is, uh, is, is using it for, for its advertising purposes that are, that are well trailed. So on the commercial side, I would defer um, to John and to Helen um, and to probably others in the room um, uh, who are possibly more knowledgeable 
than I am because I don't get involved in that. What I would say on the prism stuff, on surveillance, um, and I say the following, um, uh, not uninformed, um, is, uh, is as follows. Uh, when the Guardian story broke, the first day was Verizon and the telcos. And tel uh, telco companies are quite different. Um, they have a long history, particularly ones that were national uh, companies. They had a back, literally a back door to, to government, to the state. And in most countries, telcos and um, now um, mobile operators are not given the license to operate in that, com in that country unless they provide literally an open door um, for, for, for governments um, to do that. Um, and it's a totally different um, uh, way of operating. Now, as regards um, Google, the issue of uh, handing over uh, data about individuals um, who are under suspicion uh, is uh, well documented and well rehearsed in their twice yearly transparency reports, which are published uh, with a certain amount of information, and each time seems to be a bit more information the other, than the other. And you can see them, you, you go, you can literally, dare I say it, Google it, a uh, transparency report, and you will find it. Um, and what it says is it goes country by country in the world, um, and it, over the, the six-month period um, to that point, how many requests of, of in, for individual um, data um, of, for an individual user um, have been lodged, and the percentage of compliance. What they're now doing is also doing it in two categories, national security, child protection, um, uh, copyright violation. <coughs> Um, and you can see it. So certain countries, you know, I can't remember the figures to hand, and, and they change all the time. Um, sort of Norway, Sweden, whatever compliance is sort of 90, 95 percent. So the amount of times that they push back and say, no, we're not giving you that, <coughs> is relatively small. Um, US and Britain are both in the 70s and early 80s. Again, I, I say that as a, uh, you, you'll get the actual numbers if you look at it yourself. And then you go to sort of Russia, or whatever, it's sort of, three or four percent, and that's probably child protection or, 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 or whatever else. Um, and, and, it's, um, and it's there. What was not included uh, was the stuff that was part of the national security letters, which they're now pushing back and, and asking that they can be more transparent about. Now, when all the Guardian stories happened on that Friday weekend, you know, I made my own inquiries because it would have affected my own position and my own credibility. Um, and was told in no uncertain, which uh, uh, coincided with Larry Page's statement, and then David, Larry Page being the CEO, and then David Drummond, who's the chief legal officer, um, who simply said, um, and you can find the quotes in the Channel 4 interview and in, and in a, a Guardian Q&A, um, simply this does not happen. The idea of an open door, of a sort of funnel, you know, and just sort of literally hoover all the stuff up, provided by the companies systemically, according to these statements, um, does not happen, has not happened, does not happen. Are there individual spies or people who are doing all kinds of collaboration? Well, there have been spies at the BBC over the years. You know, there may be, who knows. But as far as companies, that company is concerned, and the other companies put out similar statements, that does not happen. So what there is, according to the official line, is individuals. So um, MI6 go to Google, and it's called a recognized uh, legal authority, which obviously varies from country to country, and says, we are worried about Mr. X. Um, uh, we need to see uh, his data over the past six months and uh, over, the next six, uh, over the next six months for the following reasons. And to the percentage I've just given you, that is complied with or not complied with or further information is written. That is individual requests. It is not, you know, Put, put in your funnel, open the door, use whatever metaphor you want, um, and just uh, pick whatever you like. Take it all and, and just have a good read and discard what you don't need. The, what you know, I am told, and I have good reason to believe it, that that, so there's a difference between individual requests, and, and, and the numbers are there, um, and uh, an open door to, to look at whatever you want. Does that help? Does that answer?
Helen, quickly, and then we'll do a last few questions, but you wanted to come in quickly on that. Well, just quickly, I mean, I suppose one crumb of comfort, if you like, is that just as um, the internet and social media do, do allow, uh, give governments much greater potential to collect data, they also allow um, citizens much greater potential to expose breaches of privacy. We are probably all here now because, um, you, you well, know... That's why I said partners in crime, we're part of that. Yeah, but we, 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 you know, it's much more potential for ordinary people to play a role in exposing it, to be vigilantes against loss of privacy, etc. I will take three uh, final quick-fire questions. The gentleman in the blue T-shirt who caught my eye ages ago, and I lamentably failed in my chairman's duties. If you want to ask the, uh, the first one, and then the two ladies uh, who just caught my eye now, and then we'll have to bring it uh, to an end, I'm afraid, because we've got four minutes left. Hello. I'm um, just picking up on what I think uh, Malcolm Rifkin s talked about, um, the division between uh, serious crime and terrorism, which the intelligence services do look at, and political dissent, polit uh, domestic political dissent, which they don't. But that's a very kind of subjective boundary. And the, the police, for example, have drawn a bl boundary in one place and they've given themselves a blank check to use their own common sense as to where that boundary lies. And so that, that's a concern that I have. But um, I, it kind of partly in respect of that, I'm also reminded of, of uh, something that the intelligence, American intelligence historian Thomas Powers said, which is that one function of the security services, intelligence services, is basically to enhance the, the power of the executive against the other arms of, of, of government. And that would uh, be one thing that um, affects how, where they draw that, that boundary. So I wonder if anyone else had a okay. comment on it. But in, in brief, your first point is about the police and whether they're bound by the same... Uh, no, it wasn't. It was about where either the, the police political are one example... Dissent. Political dissent. But it's okay. where that boundary is drawn, either okay. by the police or, in this case, by the All security right. service. that's one. And then the other two, uh, please, if we could just have the questions and then we'll attempt to have a quick fire reply um, I was just going to say, do you, ever, to... do you ever... This is particularly to you on the end. I mean, do you ever worry about the close relationship between the intelligence agencies and big commercial companies like Google? Like, I know in Mountain View, GCHQ gets sent over to red team products. I mean, is that nothing that anyone worries about or anyone brings up as a point of potential concern at any point? Not that I think there's necessarily a back door, but, you know, by actively involving the intelligence agencies in security <coughs> proofing your products, there seems to be a bit of a sort of disconnect. Last question. The one, yeah. Um, I wanted to quickly make um, asked two very minor questions. One was to um, follow up your question about the consent given to large companies or even small companies to use their products and whether in light of this negotiation, this um, public debate, there will be a public debate about the amount of information that we actually give to companies when we use their products um, because that balance might be renegotiated. And um, secondly, about whether there is uh, a public engagement activity that could be done by GCHQ about their procedures, which they are allowed to make open, not necessarily about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, but more engaging the public more in transparency about how they work, um, which every other government department seems to be doing, which could engender more trust. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Should we go quickly from John to Malcolm to John on that? And, and then if you wanted to uh, add any last thought from Helen. Well, just very quickly, on your point, I'm unsighted on that. If I'll give you my email, and I'd be interested <laughs> in, in hearing more, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the information. Well, you know, I want to know exactly what, what the nature of what it is, um, you know, that, you know, because I have, you know, um, I'm not, uh, <laughs> what's the word? You know, I, you know, I know quite a lot of what's going on, but on that specific point, you know, uh, we'll communicate, and I, I will get some more. Um, and I just wanted to... Uh, uh, just slightly turning around and just end my uh, little uh, contribution by exhorting Malcolm to really um, seek to embrace what has happened with PRISM in terms of your investigating. The impression I, I, I think the public has, or at least um, certain parts of the public um, has, is that the, the Whitehall cocoon, of course, you are holding them to account for, for specific things, and the integrity uh, of the committee um, is, is strong. But there is a, a club feel. There is a sense that, you know, come on, chaps, you know, we want a little bit more here, a little bit more there, uh, but actually things are, things are basically fine. When one hears the endless remarks that Alex Carlyle keeps on saying, which is just simply, give us more, give us more, you know, everything is wonderful, it does undermine, in my view, um, the credibility of 
the oversight. And the more you guys push on the transparency and the more you do in public and the more you ask searching questions and probe them. I mean, William Hague's statement to the Commons was a masterclass in not dealing with a single question <laughs> that was raised. I mean, it was true. And what was even more depressing was how credulous yeah. the MPs were. Yeah. They were shocking, and also how techno-ignorant they all were. He could simply come up with uh, some choice phrases, and everybody said, just wonderful, wonderful, rah, rah, as you were. And um, to me, that goes to the heart. It's the inability of politicians to confront the issue within all the confines of national security, narrowly defined. Um, that is doing potentially more damage than potential abuses of power of, of the services. Well, William Higgs' uh, speech uh, statement was actually much more impressive than you imply because he kept saying that will be for the Intelligence and Security Committee to investigate. <laughs> <laughs> they now have the powers to be able to do that. So the buck was uh, very effectively uh, passed, and I don't object to that. Two very quick points. On political dissent, political dissent is not a crime in the United Kingdom. The agencies have no legal right. Ministers would have, have no legal right uh, to uh, use the agencies to deal with questions of political dissent unless individuals are breaking the law or uh, seeking to break the law in some obvious uh, way in the law. It's, uh, mm? No, no, well, well of course, no, back I, in the Cold War you, context. No, where, where you said a, it was a political uh, dissenter is no more entitled to break the law than anybody else. The, we, we, maybe if the law needs to be changed, then that's for Parliament to be persuaded to change the law. The law applies to all of us equally, whether you, uh, you're a political dissenter or not. Including but, bankers. Hmm? It applies to bankers also. It yeah, damn well ought to. Of course it should. That, that's, and that's why it's been considered. Checking. Yeah, of course it should. And, okay. if, and if the law is not good enough, the law should be strengthened to deal with that e effectively. On the second point about transparency, and uh, we've, we, there's a long way still to go, but we've come quite a long way. 25 years ago, nobody admitted that our intelligence yeah. agencies even existed. <laughs> they were never acknowledged <laughs> to even exist. Uh, the Russians knew where MI6 and MI5 and GCHQ were. Uh, but thanks to Philby and McLean and Burgess and so forth, it was never publicly acknowledged. We now have a situation where already the heads of the three intelligence agencies make speeches in public, which they never did at all until two or three years ago. We are having, for the very first time, we've got uh, the agreement of the agencies to have a public session when we will uh, put questions to them which they will have to answer in public session. But I want to give a caveat. We cannot carry out an investigation in public. Because to carry out an investigation, you have to go beyond asking questions to the agencies. You actually have to get access and look at the raw intelligence material on which they have based their assurances. And that you cannot do in public. So what the, what the public sessions will do is we will, uh, the sort of issues we will raise is, for example, why do we need intelligence agencies after the end of the Cold War? What is your relationship with foreign intelligence agencies? How do you cooperate with intelligence agencies that may come from a different political uh, uh, system? Uh, how do you spend two billion pounds between the three of you of public money? Do we get value for money on that? Some of the points that were raised by the earlier question. So there's a lot of good issues that can be and ought to be discussed in public because they're not national secrets. But they okay. go directly to the work of the intelligence agencies. John, quickly, did you want to... And come back particularly on the lady's question about the great things you agree to and smaller companies and... Well, I, 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 it, it's, it's, it's so banal as to almost not very quick. We, what has happened is that we have, we, we have been sleepwalking into an existential crisis, all of us. Um, but th this technology has it's immensely powerful, it's immensely seductive, um, and, and we have <coughs> embraced it with gleefully. And now we're coming to grips with the, the consequences of that. And we're only at the beginning of it. Mm. Absolutely. Helen? Yeah, well, just the last point, I think, it, it, is to go back to, uh, uh, I mean, this is a, a, an extraordinary thing. I, I totally agree with M Malcolm that we know far more than we used to know. But the, the existence of data like Prism and Tempura has ratcheted the whole up to a whole other scale about what, what, what we need to know. That, that's the trouble. Could be going to allow us to predict the next financial crisis and, you know, make the world a much, much better place, but the point is we don't know. 
I think one of the most interesting things I saw uh, was a letter from the union rep at GCHQ to the Guardian. I don't know how many of you <laughs> spotted that, but it was quite interesting. It was, how dare you say that our staff would be involved in this blanket? <laughs> We're all really hurt and offended by this idea that we would behave in an illegal... Which I thought was quite interesting coming from the union rep. I mean, I, I, my, my last thought, and I will end with an anecdote... Uh, is that I do basically trust the integrity of the people uh, in the UK context to involve with this. But I do think an awful lot of it, it, there's a battle of wits that goes on. And I recall meeting a contact, a senior MI6 officer, shortly after the appointment of a certain foreign secretary. And the con there's normal thing, you know, what, what do you make of them? I said my few vacuous words. And I said to him, what do you make of them? And he said something faintly damning about this person and their attention to detail. And then I said, well, it's a good week to bang in some submissions for some really dodgy operations then. And he looked at me and he said, ah, Mark, how well you know us. <laughs> um, so on that thought, I'd like to thank all the panellists for a brilliant and incisive discussion. And thank you, too. <laughs> Trying to work out which one it is. <laughs>